I'm 36 years old, by the way, and my husband is 38 years old. My daughter just turned 16 a few months ago, and she has decided to show me how bratty teenagers can be by marriage, what one would call a miracle marriage. Why? That's because it was never really meant to happen in the first place. But circumstances made me meet my husband. Everything I have done I did for my family. But now, they are against me. I did cheat on him truly, and I regret it with every single fiber in me. I hate myself and I've tried to forget about me cheating on him. It's something I'm not proud of at all. That's why it hurts me that a video evidence is out there that shows what I did. If I regret it, then why did I do it? Honestly, it was a build-up in our marriage. It all started from the day I got greedy and stopped being content with my marriage. I started going out with the wrong friends and I just got too wild and irresponsible. I know I'm in my late 30s and shouldn't be talking about peer influence, but that's what happened. I just got uncontrollable to the extent that I started making the wrong choices frequently. Greg didn't earn enough and it was embarrassing. I took matters into my own hands and decided to mingle with my rich friends and ask them for a way out. I wanted to live a better life, so I asked my friends to help me out. They told me the best way to do that was to mingle with rich people and ask them for help. I started doing that, but it was the start of the end of my marriage. Greg just hated my desire to become wild and social. Greg noticed the change in me and tried his best to get close enough to ask why I was being someone different, but I refused to listen to him. I would leave the house late in the night and come back the next morning. Things got so bad that Greg had to take our daughter to his mother's house. He claimed that I was just being too horrible as a mother. Was he exaggerating? He definitely wasn't because even I realized that I was a bad mother to her at some point. I didn't pay attention to my daughter because I was too busy trying to fit in with my wild and classy friends. My main agenda was to get us a better life, but I lost focus. And that's how I ended up cheating on Greg. Never did I imagine that my wild escapes would lead to me being unfaithful in my marriage. But it happened. It all started at my friend's house party. It was a very wild party and many adults were doing questionable things. Even the people I knew claimed to be happily married were cheating on their partners like it was nothing. Of course I noticed what was going on, but I never thought I would fall victim to it. So how did it happen? I was shocked when a tall guy walked into the room. There's nothing special about a tall guy walking into the room, right? But this particular guy seemed to grab a lot of attention. That's the only reason I noticed his presence. I also noticed that my friend who was hosting the house party left what she was doing just to run to him and welcome him. It was later that evening I discovered that the tall guy was my friend's boss. That's how my greed kicked in. Look, Greg is not poor, struggling, but he's definitely not rich. He's the only son out of seven children, so he takes care of his entire family, too. Most of the money he learns hardly ever remains enough to be used for purchasing expensive things. Once in a while, we struggle for what to eat. Even my daughter's future in college is rocky because we do not have a lot saved up. And it doesn't help that I'm a housewife and I do not work. When I saw Tom, I just thought it would be nice to have him as a friend so he could help Greg with a job at his company. I can swear that it was all I thought about. I was desperate to have a fancy house party, just like my friend, and I knew that Tom giving Frank a job would do that. So I got carried away with the lavish lifestyle of the new friends I got introduced to. Should have known better, but I didn't. So I got carried away by the tall man who owned a successful company. I'll be calling him Tom, by the way. Tom was not attractive in any way, if that's what you're thinking. He had a big belly like those typical rich men, and he seemed like he lacked sleep. At that moment, all I did was admire his wealth. I didn't think of him in any other way except that one way or another I got drunk, and then my friend invited me to meet Tom. We exchanged numbers, and then I left the party. Two weeks after that, I met up with Tom for coffee, and that's where my misery began. How did my misery begin? It started with how cunning Tom was. I thought he was just going to be a good man who wanted to help my husband, but instead he was a predator and I became his prey. I told him I needed help and asked him if he could hire Greg or give him a position at his workplace. I didn't ask him for money because I knew that would crush Greg's pride. Tom didn't say yes or no immediately. He just decided to let me know. Greg was lucky to have a wife like me. He told me that I wasn't even supposed to be the one looking for a job for my husband. I tried to ignore all the sweet words at first, 
but it was only a matter of time before it started getting to my head. After up to three meetings with Tom, I started feeling like I married a failure. Tom had been spending money on me and telling me I needed to be treated as a princess instead of going around begging people to get a job for my husband. As a result of all those things, I actually started believing them. I got irritated with Greg in the house and just felt like he wasn't doing enough to bring money to the house. I started comparing Greg with Tom, and then I began to believe everything Tom was telling me. I won't lie and try to make it seem like a part of me didn't get carried away. I started following Tom out. He was buying me things. And then I forgot the reason why I even contacted him in the first place. At some point, Greg brought Leah back into the house and my daughter started living with us again. Leah turned SD empty. Turned 16 yet, but she was still very smart. How smart was she? Well, she was smart enough to catch me calling Tom secretly in the night. She knew I wasn't talking to Greg because he was asleep in the living room. That fateful day was the beginning of my troubles with my daughter. Never did I imagine that she would end up betraying me at the end of the day. She confronted me and I told her it was nobody. I never imagined that Leah didn't drop the topic or that she decided to keep an eye on me. I underestimated her, and that was the mistake I made. I'd already started cheating Greg by that time, and Tom was already my affair partner. One day, Tom and I decided to go out on a special date, and I wore a very revealing dress that day. Leah was the only one at home when I left, so I didn't even worry about it. Tom and I were all over each other like an actual married couple. I forgot all about the date and moved on with my life. Tom and I continued dating for some time, but then I noticed that Tom was a very manipulative person. I realized that they actually had no good intentions. He was manipulative and just wanted to control me, so I decided to end with him. I also noticed that he didn't want to get me a job that would earn me money. He just wanted to be the one to give me money so he would have an upper hand. That's how I ended up breaking up with him. I instantly regretted everything because it dawned on me that I had gone the wrong way. I feel so beautiful cheating on my husband, and I wanted to take back everything I did. I tried to be a better wife and started to turn a new leaf on, known to me that my husband and daughter had been scheming behind my back. I had no idea that Leah had a video of me on the date with Tom, and that she had gone ahead to show Greg the video while I was dying with regret and trying my best to turn a new leaf. My own daughter was planning with her father on how to make me regret my actions. I know you all must be asking yourself how I got to know that they were planning to ruin my life. Well, it started when I started not to sing somewhere behavior from both Leah and Greg. I noticed that no matter what I did, they isolated themselves from me and formed what seemed like a clique. They stopped eating the food I prepared and I noticed that Greg stopped giving me money altogether. At first I didn't bother because I still had enough money saved up from what Tom had given me. But then I got broke and had no choice than to get to the bottom of things. Even though I noticed that things were weird, I never saw what they had installed for me coming. I had started up a business secretly with the money I saved up from Tom. I also used part of the money from my money with Greg. We had a joint savings account, so I used some money from there. I planned on returning it when my business got successful. I didn't tell anyone about the business, so it came as a shock to me when I came to the store one day and found out that all the things I bought and saved up in the store were gone. There was absolutely nothing left, and it made me look like a crazy woman. Do you know just how stupid it made me look? I was alone in the empty store, wondering where everything had gone, and also knowing full well that I couldn't ask anyone where my things were because no one was aware of my business. I felt like going crazy, but I had to pull myself together and start asking people around the store. None of them knew what had happened because it was a Monday morning and no one was at work during the weekend. I just kept quiet and couldn't speak. What would I say to Greg when he asked me where I got money from to start a business? I would have to tell him about Tom, and then I would also have to tell him I stole from him. There was fire on the mountain, and the fire was so strong that it was burning me silently. There was nothing I could do to help myself rather than shut up and just let things be. I finally got to understand that a lie would need another lie, and then you would just keep lying. Do you know how hard it was for me to cope with the fact that someone stole everything I had, but I couldn't act on it because I stole too? As if that wasn't enough, I started noticing how distantly I became. The worst part was that she stopped calling me mother. Greg stopped sleeping in the same room with me and started staying out late. In fact, 
Leah even left the house and went to Greg's maternal home without letting me know. She blocked my number and stopped contacting me. I tried asking Greg, but he was never at home. They left the whole house to me. You think that ghosting me was enough for them? Well, brace yourselves, because it was just the tip of the iceberg. Greg stopped providing for the house and left me broke and hungry. I needed energy to find who stole from me, but I had to worry about what to eat. My friend called one day and told me she saw Greg with another woman at a hotel. Yes, it's not a prank, that's the truth. I refused to believe it at first, but I discovered that she wasn't lying. Greg started cheating on me. Do you know how much that hurt me? I've been dying of guilt, but he went out of his way to cheat on me. I didn't like that at all. So I decided to confront him one day. What did I get in return? He gave me divorce papers. Yes, he did. That. I went to confront him about his cheating, but instead he served me divorce papers and told me to go to hell. It's not just what he did that hurt me. It's the fact that I felt like I was going crazy. So many things were just happening and I had no explanation for it. I was left to ask myself what I really did wrong and why. It seemed like life was just playing its cruel games on me. Then, just when I decided to find the answers for my daughter, another stupid thing happened. So what else could happen, right? I mean, I'd already gone through a lot in the hands of both my husband and my daughter, but they were not done. When I went to visit Leah at her grandmother's house, I got the biggest embarrassment of my life. On a normal day, Greg's mother doesn't like me one bit. We have never been on good terms, and that's why I didn't come to look for Leah early enough. I just didn't want to come in contact with that woman. But at the end of the day, I had no choice but to see her because I needed to ask Leah questions. But when I came looking for Leah, it was Greg's mother I met. Leah had gone out with her friends, and so I had to meet his mother. That woman spoke down on me and had the audacity to call me cheap names. She called me the worst decision her child ever made and then told me I was an embarrassment to a mother's. Of course, that hurt me a lot, and I didn't like the way she spoke to me at all. I left her place feeling very insulted that day. I was too worried and embarrassed to just let things go and go back home. So I decided to go to Greg's. I worked. Please, since I didn't know where he was staying since he left the house, I was able to find Greg at his workplace. And even though he tried his best not to speak to me, I refused to listen to him and made sure I got some alone time with him. I confronted him about everything that had been happening and asked them why Leah had moved out of the house and why his mother had the audacity to speak to me anyhow. I also confronted him about the divorce and told him I was not going to sign the papers. I was so confident when I confronted him because I believed that he would act like his normal calm self and just give in to my demands. But instead, I got the shock of my life when he became very angry with me and embarrassed me in his workplace without thinking twice, even in the presence of people. He called me a cheater and told me that he wanted nothing to do with me and that I should not expect him to bring Leah back to the house. I had a lot to say, but because of the way people are gathered around us, I had to leave. I also didn't like the factors, and people were recording us, and I found it very embarrassing. I noticed that he didn't have a problem with it, so I came to the conclusion that he had a hand in it. I kept thinking about the fact that book read and his mother called me. She has and that made me wonder if they found out I had been cheating on me, even though I knew it was a possibility. I thought I was so clean and too careful with my movements that I didn't believe that anyone would have caught me. But all that confidence went to the drain when Greg came to the house with his lawyer to talk about the divorce. He told me he was aware that I had taken money out of our joint savings account without his permission. That really came as a surprise to me because I knew Greg Greg wasn't one to check his phone frequently. The debit appeared in his messages and I deleted it, so I was surprised that he was able to notice. He wanted me to return the money within two days, or else I was going to lose everything I purchased with that money. It was at that moment that I discovered that he knew what happened to my goods. I asked him if he was the one who stole from me and he told me he wasn't the one. He just told me that he knew the person who stole and would only reveal the person when I returned the money because I was desperate to get my life back on track. I went back to Tom and pleaded on my knees for him to lend me money. Tom refused to give me any money and told me that he no longer had any interest in me. I was so embarrassed and dejected that I had no choice but to loan the money for my bank. I had the confidence to do that because I believed I would end the money back once I got my stolen goods back. I was able to get the money and then give it to Greg. 
He then told me that he would tell me who stole the goods once I signed the divorce papers. Once again, I was stupid enough to sign the device papers in order to earn money. I was also made to sign a document that stated that I would not ask for any spousal support. That one was very easy for me to sign because I didn't even think Greg had any property or money that he could give me. I believe so much in the amount of money I have invested into stolen goals that I know that it was worth more money than any spousal support I could get because it was an investment that I would only appreciate. It was after I signed the divorce papers that I realized that I had been scammed by my own husband. Greg told me he didn't know who stole the goods and that he only said that so it could get me to do what he wanted. It felt like I was running mad and I felt so dejected because I didn't expect him to do that to me. The betrayal was cruel, and I felt like I was so alone with no one to support me. What hurt me most was when I discovered that Greg actually knew what happened to my goods. He didn't just know he was the one who stole it. When I found out I was so angry that I almost ran mad, I refused to let it go and decided to tell my lawyer. I waited until two months after our divorce was finalized to take the case to court. I sued him for theft of property. My lawyer tried his best but I just didn't have any evidence. The fact that I didn't tell anyone about it made it hard for the court to believe he was a culprit. His lawyer argued that Greg couldn't steal from a business he didn't know existed till after its destruction with no evidence. I was literally crushed in court. The only evidence I had was the recording of him admitting to it when I confronted him. But then Leah deleted the recording from my phone after making me think she just wanted to type in the phone number. She didn't block me on even after I found out she was the one that showed Greg the video of me cheating. I received her with open arms when she apologized to me and said she was sorry. I'm still a mother, and I got soft. I never imagined that Greg was using my own daughter against me. He had teamed up with him to get revenge on me for cheating on him. He claimed that's what I deserved for being greedy, neglecting my daughter, and stealing from him. I never got my goods back, yet he calls me a thief. The main reason I even went to Tom was for him. I feel betrayed by my husband and daughter, and I'm in debt. It's so cruel. Update. Hi, guys. They say time heals all wounds, but I can tell you for free that my wounds are yet to heal. I'm still yet to speak to my daughter after three months, and she has made no move to reach out to me. Not even Greg cares. He's dating some other lady now and has forgotten all about me. I keep sending him texts asking for my money, but he keeps ignoring me. In fact, he has blocked me many times. My bank is on my neck and I'm barely feeding. Well, the fact that I've lost my business is just too hurtful. If this is a bad dream, then I need to wake up. Someone, please help. I feel so betrayed. It hurts. It really does. Here's the next story. It was one of those classic rainy days in Edinburgh. You know, the type where the rain drizzles down just lightly enough that it's almost romantic, but just heavy enough to warrant an umbrella. The streets had that fresh rain scent and the cobblestones glistened with tiny puddles reflecting the gray sky. Most folks dashed about, but not me. I was in no hurry, completely engrossed in the beauty of the rain. I remember I was trying to take a picture of the castle from this particular angle. When I bumped into someone looking down, I saw this girl, Alicia, on the ground. Her papers all scattered, her umbrella flipped inside out. But what caught my attention was her reaction. She was laughing, not embarrassed or angry, just genuinely laughing at the mess we'd created. We got to talking and there was this instant connection. It's crazy. It felt like I'd known her for ages. She had these piercing blue eyes that seemed to dance when she spoke and a laugh that was so contagious. I found myself chuckling along even when nothing was particularly funny. Alicia was studying art history and had a deep love for Edinburgh's architecture. She showed me the city through her eyes that day, and I was utterly captivated both by her and the stories she told. Our dates were straight out of a rom-com picnics in Prince's Street Gardens, late-night walks along the Royal Mile, sharing stories, dreams, and churros from that tiny stall near the Scottish National Gallery. It felt like fate had thrown us together when I proposed only a few months later. Under the twinkling fairy lights of Circus Lane, she said yes without hesitation. Our friends said we were mad, rushing things, but it felt right, you know. We were young, in love, and had dreams as fast as the sky. The wedding was a small, intimate affair, but brimming with genuine happiness. That beginning, it was like something out of a fairy tale. 
Little did I know that every story has its twists and turns, but that's for later. All right, read it. This is where the gut feeling started to creep in, even though I didn't fully realize it at the time. After the fairy tale start, life began settling into a sort of rhythm. We were newlyweds, figuring out how to live together, sharing our space and our lives. The fun part, getting to know all of Alicia's friends. She had this close-knit group from college, and they'd meet every other week, and I'd occasionally join in. There was this one friend of hers, Zora, who always stood out. Fiery redhead, incredibly sharp wit, and always seemed to have a protective aura around Alexia. One day after one of those dinner get-togethers, I was helping clean up. When Zora cornered me in the kitchen, she looked serious, almost concerned. And I remember thinking she was going to talk about some diet or kitchen hack, but no. She leaned in and in a hushed tone that I could barely hear over the clamor of the party. She whispered, John, Alicia isn't who you think she is. I blinked, taken aback. Was this some sort of joke? I chuckled awkwardly, trying to brush it off, thinking maybe this was some weird way of hers to break the ice. But the look on his face was dead serious. She continued, Just be careful, okay? Watch out for signs. Now, I'll admit. Alarm bells did ring in my head, but I immediately pushed them aside. I thought maybe Zora was just being overly protective. Or perhaps she had some unresolved issues with Alicia. Besides, I trusted Alicia. Our love story felt too real, too raw to be tainted by whatever Zora was hinting at. I gave Zora a tight smile and nodded, saying thanks for the concern. But I trust Alicia with all my heart. Zora just looked at me with sad eyes, as if she wished she could say more, but was bound by some unspoken promise. That night, as I lay in bed next to Alicia, her rhythmic breathing lulling me to sleep, I couldn't shake off Zora's words, but every time doubt crept in, I'd brush it away. Love, after all, was about trust, right? But read it as you'll come to see. Those words planted a seed that would grow into an overhanging cloud of doubt. So read it. The thing about trust is that once there's even a tiny crack in its foundation, everything else seems a little off-kilter. I hate to admit it, but those words from Zora, they stuck. And perhaps it was that whisper of doubt that made me notice things I would have otherwise overlooked. Fast forward a few weeks and it was a Saturday morning. Alicia had this ritual of heading out to her favorite cafe every Saturday to catch up on her reading. She'd get this massive cup of chai latte, immersed herself in a book and just escape for a while. I'd often teased her about her sacred weekend ritual, but deep down, I loved how passionate she was about her little routines. That morning, she left her bag on the kitchen table in her hurry. She called out laughing. If I forget my head one day, could you remember to pack that for me too? I remember laughing at her adorable clumsiness. After she left, I decided to be the good husband and pack up her essentials, her wallet, her book, and her favorite pen. But as I was doing so, my fingers brushed against something cold and metallic at the bottom of her bag. I pulled out a shimmering necklace. It was delicate with a sparkling pendant that had an intricate design I didn't recognize. It was beautiful, but it was also entirely unfamiliar. I had never seen it on Alicia, and I certainly hadn't gifted it to her. My first thought, maybe it was a family heirloom or something she'd bought recently. Later that evening, as we settled in with some takeaway and a movie, I casually brought it up. Hey, I found this necklace in your bag. It's pretty new. She looked momentarily taken aback and then replied, That. It's from my aunt. She gave it to me last week when I visited her. She quickly took it from my hand and set it aside, but read it. Something felt off. It was in the split second of hesitation before she answered, or maybe the way she avoided eye contact just then. Or maybe it was my now slightly suspicious mind overanalyzing, but it felt like there was something she wasn't telling me. I wanted to believe her. I really did. I told myself Zara's words were just playing tricks on my mind and there was a perfectly reasonable explanation for the necklace. Yet as the night wore on and as Alicia snuggled up to me, the weight of that necklace felt like an anchor pulling me down into a sea of doubt. All right, read it. Things started spiraling from here and I felt like I was in one of those mystery thriller movies. In the days following the necklace incident, I tried to get back to our normal rhythm. We laughed, made plans, even talked about taking a trip to the Highlands together. But every so often I'd catch Eliseo looking distant, lost in thought. 
I chalked it up to stress or maybe some issues at her work. We all have those moments, right? One night we were curled up on our couch watching some cheesy rom-com. We were sharing a blanket and Alicia had her phone next to her on the couch as the movie played. I noticed her phone lighting up repeatedly. Buzz pours buzz again. Now Elisa is popular and her phone's almost always buzzing. But that night, every time it did, she would subtly shift her position, ensuring the screen stayed hidden from my view. I tried to ignore it, focusing on the movie, but it was like a mosquito in a quiet room. Impossible to ignore. Then, during a particularly quiet scene in the movie, it buzzed again, lighting up bright enough for me to catch a glimpse, a message from Elle that read, I can't wait to see you tomorrow. My heart sank. The way it was written, it wasn't just a casual meetup. There was intimacy in those words. And who was Elle? None of her close friends had names, starting with that letter as casually as I could muster. I asked, Who's texting you this late? She glanced at her phone and quickly replied, Just some work stuff. You know how it is. But she didn't open the message. Instead, she turned off her phone screen and snuggled closer to me. Sleep was elusive that night. Every worst-case scenario played out in my mind. Was it a co-worker? An old flame? The unknowns were eating at me, but more than anything, it was the secrecy, the hiding. If it was innocent, why not just tell me? The next morning, she was gone early, leaving a note about an early work meeting. All day, I was restless, debating whether to confront her or to let it go. By evening, I decided that trust was key, and I'd been acting like a crazy, paranoid husband. Hey, Reddit, the rabbit hole just kept getting deeper. Here's where the roller coaster took another steep dive. It was on a Thursday afternoon when I met up with my mate Theo for a pint at our local pub. We'd been friends since high school, and he'd recently moved to London for work. He was back in Edinburgh for a few days, and we were catching up on life work and all the usual banter about halfway through our second pint. Theo, with a hesitant look, asked John, Is everything okay with you and Alicia? I remember frowning slightly tipsy and replied, Yeah, mate, why? Theo took a deep breath. Look, I might be wrong and I don't want to cause any trouble, but I thought I saw Alicia at King's Cross Station in London last Tuesday. She was with some guy, tall, dark-haired, looked a bit like a model. They seemed close. My heart started racing. Alicia hadn't mentioned going to London. In fact, she told me she had meetings in Birmingham that day. I tried to keep my composure. Theo, are you sure it was her? King's Cross is always packed. Could have been anyone. Theo looked uncomfortable. I mean, I wasn't spying or anything, just waiting for my train. But yeah, pretty sure it was her. She had that unique pendant around her neck the one you found in her bag. I took a deep breath. My mind was racing. Was Theo mistaken? But the mention of the necklace made it hard to believe it was just a coincidence. I finished my drink and headed home. My mind, a whirlwind of thoughts. I decided to confront Alicia about it as I stepped into our apartment. She greeted me with her usual bright smile, completely oblivious to the storm raging inside me. How was drinks with Theo? She asked casually. Without skipping a beat, I blurted out, Were you in London last Tuesday? She looked taken aback. No, I was in Birmingham for meetings, remember? Why? Theo said he saw you at King's Cross with some guy. Alicia laughed, but there was an edge to it. Theo must have been mistaken. I was nowhere near London. Maybe he saw someone who looked like me. I wanted to believe her. I desperately did. But the lies, the necklace, the texts, everything piled up making it hard to see through the fog of doubt. She must have noticed the skepticism on my face because she came over, held my face and said, John, you trust me, right? And read it as much as I wanted to scream. Yes. All I managed was a nod while my insides continued their turmoil. The journey from total trust to total doubt is a short one, and I was now at a crossroads, wondering which path to take. All right, read it. Buckle up. Because this chapter in our saga... It's wild. It was on a sunny Saturday morning, almost deceptively peaceful given the storm that was brewing inside our relationship. I was tidying up the study, clearing out old papers and random junk we'd accumulated over the years in my quest for order. I opened a drawer. That was Elise's domain, mostly filled with her stuff, things she'd pick up mean to use and then forget, amidst the collection of pens, old receipts, and miscellaneous knickknacks. I spotted a folded paper that looked distinctly like a hotel booking confirmation. Curiosity peaked, and yes, I know, 
Perhaps it was wrong to snoop. I opened it up. It was a reservation for the Ritz in London, a luxurious suite for a weekend under Elise's name. My heart raced memories of Theo's sighting in London flooding back. This was evidence, wasn't it? Or was I jumping to conclusions? I needed answers. That evening, over dinner, I slid the confirmation across the table. Found this today, I said, trying to keep my voice steady. Planning a trip to London? Eliza. His eyes widened momentarily, but she quickly regained her composure. That. It's a surprise for Zara's birthday. I wanted to treat her to a fancy weekend, you know, girl's trip kind of thing. Remember Zara, the friend who'd warned me about Eliza? This didn't make any sense. If Zara felt Alessio was hiding something from me, why would she be planning a luxurious weekend away with her? Alexia, why didn't you tell me? And why would you take Zara to the Ritz? Seems excessive. She hesitated, biting her lip. I just wanted it to be a surprise for everyone, and after everything that's happened recently, I thought Zara and I could use some bonding time. Read it. The stories weren't adding up. Here was my wife spinning what seemed like tales right in front of me. My trust was on thin ice, and the weight of all these secrets threatened to break it completely. I tried to push the doubts aside, hoping there was some grain of truth in her words, but the idea of my Alexia at the Ritz with someone who wasn't me painted a picture I couldn't ignore. Would I ever find out the truth behind all these half-told tales? Read it. I knew I had to confront Zara. If there was even a sliver of truth in Alicia's story, Zara would be my ticket to clarity. But if Alicia was lying, well, Zara had already warned me once, hadn't she? I gave Zara a ring, and we decided to meet at this quiet little cafe in Edinburgh. The kind of place where conversations felt private, even amidst the clatter of cups and saucers. As I walked in, I spotted Zara by the window. Her expression was one of surprise mixed with concern. I took a deep breath and walked over. Zara wasted no time. John, why did you want to meet? Is everything okay with Alicia? Hesitating, I showed her the hotel booking confirmation. Alicia told me she booked this for your birthday. A girl's trip to the Ritz. Is it true? Zara's eyes went wide, genuine shock registering on her face. John, I have no idea what you're talking about. My birthday isn't even around this date, and I haven't planned any trips with Alicia. My heart sank another lie, but Alicia said Zara cut me off, her voice soft. John, I warned you about Alicia. I've been noticing her acting strange lately, distancing herself, making excuses, always on her phone. I thought it was just stress or work. But now I'm genuinely worried. The weight of everything hit me, Doe citing the texts, the necklace, and now this. Each lie was a dagger, slowly piercing the trust I once had in Alexia Zara. What do you think is going on? She sighed deeply, looking out the window. I wish I knew, John, but something's definitely up. As we parted ways, Zara hugged me, whispering, Find out the truth, John, for both your sakes. Walking home, the city of Edinburgh, which once felt like a haven for our love story, now felt like a labyrinth with secrets lurking in every corner. But one thing was clear. I was determined to find my way out and uncover the truth about Alicia's web of lies. All right, read it. If you thought this journey was a roller coaster before, you're in for a shocker. Now hold on to your hats. I made up my mind to get to the bottom of this. No more doubts, no more second guessing. I had to see for myself. So I decided to surprise Alicia during her supposed girl's trip to the Ritz. If she was indeed there with Zara, I'd apologize. Tell her it was a romantic gesture gone wrong and make amends. If not, well, I needed to know the truth. I took an early train to London my thoughts racing with every passing landscape, arriving at the Ritz. The opulence and grandeur of the place hit me. Was this the setting for Eliza's secrets? Taking a deep breath, I approached the front desk, hoping to come up with a believable excuse for them to tell me Alicia's room number, but as luck would have it, I didn't need one. From the corner of my eye, I caught a glimpse of her in the hotel bar, laughing her hair, dancing around her face. But it wasn't Zara sitting across from her. It was a man, tall, dark-haired, with a familiarity that tugged at my memory. As I inched closer, the realization hit me like a ton of bricks. That man was Lucas, my Lucas, my long-lost brother who had taken off years ago to travel the world, leaving his past behind. We had lost touch, and my last memory of him was as a free-spirited teenager, not the polished man in front of me. The laughter, 
the touching of hands, the shared glances. It wasn't just friendly, it was intimate. My heart ached. Betrayal from a partner is one thing, but from family. It's a wound that cuts deep, retreating to a quiet corner. I watched them for what felt like hours, trying to process the scene unfolding in front of me. Questions clouded my mind. How did they meet? How long had this been going on? Why Lucas? I felt lost. Stranger in a city and a life I thought I knew. Drowning in emotions and the sheer weight of the situation. I retreated from the Ritz, leaving behind two people who meant the world to me. Their world now intertwined in ways I could never have imagined. Read it. I never imagined I'd find myself in this situation. The combined sting of betrayal from your partner and your own flesh and blood is something indescribable. But here I was, ready to face it head on. After leaving the Ritz, my steps had taken me to a solicitor's office driven by raw emotion. I had divorce papers drawn up immediately. It felt impulsive, rash even. But in that moment, it was the only tangible action that seemed to provide some semblance of control over the spiraling chaos. With the papers in hand, I headed back to the Ritz. I was a man on a mission to confront and to close this chapter of my life. I wanted answers, but more than that, I wanted closure. Entering the bar once more, I spotted them, still there, engrossed in their world. The weight of the papers in my hand felt both heavy and liberating. Summoning all the strength I had left, I marched up to them without a word. I slammed the divorce papers onto their table, breaking the intimate bubble they were in. The sharp noise drew startled looks from nearby patrons. Alicia's eyes widened in horror. John, what's this? She whispered, her voice shaky. Lucas looked up his face, pale, guilt evident in his eyes. John, let me explain, he began. But I raised a hand to stop him. There's nothing to explain, I said coldly. I saw everything I needed to. Alexi, his eyes filled with tears. John, I'm so sorry, she sobbed. It was a mistake. I was lost. I was lonely. It wasn't supposed to happen. Tears streamed down her face, but they no longer had the power to move me. You were lost, I said, a voice dripping with bitterness. Seems like you found your way pretty easily to Lucas. Lucas, always the smooth talker, tried to intervene. John, we didn't plan for this. It just happened. But I was done. Done with the lies, the deceit, and the heartbreak. Save it, I spat. You both deserve each other. Turning on my heel, I walked away from the devastation I'd left behind. The cacophony of the bustling city outside mirrored the chills in my mind. But amidst it all, a quiet resolve began to take shape. I would rebuild, rediscover myself, and move forward from this pain. Read it. It's hard to put into words the emotions that course through you when the two people you trust the most betray you. It feels like drowning, like the weight of the world is on your shoulders. But as I left the Ritz that day, I also left behind the chains of betrayal, ready to embark on the journey of healing. All right, read it. Here's the final chapter of this painful saga. Brace yourselves. The cold London air felt sharp against my skin as I left the Ritz. The city lights, which once represented dreams and possibilities, now only cast shadows of doubt and pain. Each step took me further from the life I had known, the love I had felt, and the trust I had so effortlessly given, as the tube whisked me away. Flashes of the past haunted me, our first meeting in the rain-soaked streets of Edinburgh, the warmth of Alicia's embrace, Lucas's infectious laughter from our childhood memories that were now tainted forever altered by betrayal. Reaching the station, I sat on a bench watching the world go by in a blur. Strangers rushed past, each with their own stories, their own pain, and it made me realize no matter how unique our stories are, we're all bound by the threads of love, trust, and inevitably, heartbreak. Tears welled up, blurring my vision. I wasn't crying just for the love lost or the betrayal. It was the sheer unexpectedness of it all. The abrupt realization that life could take such a cruel turn without warning with a heavy heart. I boarded a train heading north away from London. I didn't have a destination in mind, but that didn't matter. I needed to be away to find a place where memories wouldn't haunt every corner. Hours turned into days. The rhythmic chugging of the train. The changing landscapes outside. The kindness of strangers. They all became a balm to my wounded soul. Slowly, the tightness in my chest began to loosen. 
I finally alighted in Manchester, a city I had no connections with a blank canvas. It felt right here, amidst the red brick buildings and bustling streets I would rebuild, not to forget, but to carry forward, bearing the scars of my past, yet not letting them define me. So here I am, read it, sitting in a small cafe in Manchester writing this out, sharing my story with you. I don't know what the future holds, but I've learned that life is unpredictable. It throws curveballs when you least expect them. But in the face of heartbreak, all we can do is pick up the pieces and keep moving forward. Thanks for listening. It's not the ending I had hoped for, but it's the one I've got. And maybe, just maybe, that's okay. Hi. Read it. I have always been a big fan of the social media, and so I see it sufficient to post about my situation here to solicit and get some advice from you guys, and to also share my story. I feel like some people could learn a lot from it, especially those currently cheating or planning to cheat on their partner. I'm currently in a very tight spot and need help. My name is Mia, and I'm a 30-year-old woman. I've been married to my husband, Ethan, who is a 32-year-old man for six years. We dated for two years before getting married. We have two kids, Lisa, who is an eight-year-old girl, and Nicholas, who is a six-year-old boy. We live in South Carolina, in the United States. It is a small town, but we are happy with it. My husband grew up here and his family is quite wealthy and connected here. Ethan and I first met in an escape room LOL. We instantly connected and took to each other like fish to water. There was just a beautiful spark between us. A bunch of years went by since our first date. And you know what? The spark between us is still kicking. I'm crazy about my husband. He gets me nails the whole dad and husband thing and goes all out for our kids, our bedroom action. No complaints there. It's active and awesome. Now we make it a point to squeeze in date nights every weekend. We're not drowning in responsibilities. Overall, are married. Life is like living in a dream. But let's be real. We're far from perfect. He's got stuff I wish he'd tweak. And I've got my own list of changes for me. It's those quirks, though, that make us a perfect mess together. But here's the kicker. There was this small hiccup. I messed up, started cheating. Yeah, it's like this dark cloud hanging over our otherwise kick-ass marriage. I got caught up in something messy at work, and honestly, I can't pinpoint when or how it all went down. All I know is I ended up having a thing with a coworker. It's like the secret I stumbled into without a clear start. It's not like there was some big plan... It just kind of happened. Now I'm stuck dealing with the fallout from it. The start of this whole mess traces back to about six months ago, when my affair partner and I both joined the company and began our training simultaneously. Even in those early days, something felt off. I noticed he was unusually friendly, especially towards me. At first I brushed it off, thinking maybe he was just a sociable person. The thing is, the more I tried to ignore it, the more he seemed to crank up the friendliness. It became this weird thing of him being extra nice and me trying my best to downplay it. It was like this unspoken tension building up, creating a strange feeling that I couldn't shake off no matter how hard I tried. Jason, my co-worker, was this handsome and sociable guy that everyone at work seemed to adore. He had this reputation as the fun guy, always bringing positive vibes to the office. What puzzled me, though, was his extra effort to be nice to me. It felt like he went out of his way, and I couldn't quite figure out why. Then, after about a month or two, Jason applied to transfer to my department. Now, that really threw me for a loop. I couldn't wrap my head around why he'd want to switch, especially considering we didn't have any special projects or collaborations. Things got even stranger when we were both at a co-worker's wedding. Jason, in his usual outgoing manner, tried to dance with me. I had to put my foot down and refused, explaining that it just didn't feel right or proper given our work relationship. Jason's relentless niceness was like a never-ending loop. Whenever I told him to ease up, he'd apologized. But the very next day, he was right back at it, trying to get close to me. The weird part. I could have easily taken it up with HR, but if I'm being honest, there was a part of me that enjoyed the attention. He had this knack for noticing every little thing about me and showering compliments, especially when I changed up my look. It was a daily routine for him, complimenting me on stuff my own husband wouldn't notice. It felt like I finally had someone acknowledging my existence to be completely real. I started dressing up at work just to get those compliments from Jason. It became this strange cycle where his attention filled the void, even though I knew deep down it wasn't right. However, 
The day I finally went all the way with Jason happened during a co-worker's birthday party. The workplace had this tight-knit vibe and we all tended to be quite friendly. Whenever there was a celebration like this co-worker's birthday party, we'd all get invites. The atmosphere was laid back and everyone was having a good time. It was one of those moments where work boundaries blurred and we could just relax. Jason, true to form, was there, and the social setting made it easier for his charm to work its magic. The usual friendly banter took a turn, and before I knew it, I was falling into Jason's trap at the birthday party. Jason stuck to his routine, giving me a compliment on my appearance that genuinely brought a smile to my face. As the night progressed, the drinks flowed freely, and before I realized it, I was a bit more than tipsy. The details of when things took a turn with Jason are hazy. But what I do remember is that in the moment, I found myself enjoying it. The aftermath hit me hard. The next day, though, I had cheated on my husband. Regret flooded in, and I made a solemn vow to steer clear of Jason. Frustration and anger boiled within me, leading to a heated confrontation where I cursed him out and explicitly told him to stay away in an attempt to cut ties. I even went ahead and blocked him, attempting to put an end to the situation that had gone out of control. The enjoyment I experienced during that moment with Jason was something I couldn't admit even to myself. The days that followed were heavy with guilt. I reached a point where I couldn't face the idea of going to work and encountering Jason. In my confusion, I called in sick, using it as an excuse to seeing Jason as I was still so ashamed and angry. My husband, unsuspecting, had asked about the birthday party. I gave him the edited version, claiming it went on as usual and that I'd gotten a little tipsy. I conveniently left out the part where I got drunk, spent the night there, and sent him a text message explaining that I'd stay over at a friend's place to sober up. When he offered to pick me up, I declined, assuring him everything was fine. In reality, I spent the night with Jason. There was no way my husband would recover from that. Returning to work after those tumultuous days away was a challenge. I attempted to keep my distance from Jason, but that resolve only lasted for a brief period. Within a few days, he was back to being overly friendly, disrupting my efforts to maintain a professional distance. He'd bring me coffee, grab lunch for me during his break, and flash random smiles, my way of attempting to address the situation. Jason assured me it wasn't my fault, but his. He apologized and urged me not to worry, emphasized saying that what my husband didn't know wouldn't harm him. His attempts to comfort me was surprising, but what I desperately need, he even suggested I unblock him so we could talk after work. Now call me stupid or silly and you would not be wrong. I messed up big time. Jason kept pushing, and against my better judgment, I unblocked him. The guy's texts were annoying, yet weirdly comforting. He'd send good morning and good night texts, blab about his day, and keep saying it wasn't my fault. He even suggested we could keep our thing going without my husband knowing. And stupidly, I started buying into Jason's words. His texts, persistent as they were, messed with my head. On one hand, I was annoyed by his constant messages, but on the other, I found myself questioning my own stance. After all, what my husband didn't know would not hurt him. Jason didn't waste time breaking through my defenses. Before I knew it, we were in the middle of a secret affair. It was pretty easy to keep it hush-hush, since we worked together. We'd sneak off to the restroom during work hours for our secret meetups. I get it. It sounds dumb now, but in the excitement of it all, I was oblivious to how messed up the whole thing was to throw my husband off. I cooked up a story about wanting to boost my career, saying I'd be putting in more hours at work despite my husband being worried about me stressing out. Considering he earned more and could handle our bills, I convinced him not to stress his higher earnings also meant he had more time for the kids, which became handy while he played the responsible parent. I used the excuse of working extra hours to chill at Jason's apartment after work. We'd either wait for everyone to clear out before our secret bathroom meetings or just head over to Jason's place. Looking back, it's clear I was tangled up in a mess of lies and messed up priorities. Jason had this knack for making me feel like I was the center of the universe, like I was the only one who truly mattered. I found myself smiling more and getting all pumped up to go to work. Sick days off work became a rarity. My husband noticed my newfound enthusiasm for work and said he was glad I was happy. But he also pointed out the obvious I was neglecting the kids. He was right, but back then I was oblivious to it all. I started tuning out from parenting responsibilities, leaving all the childcare to my husband even when I was home. 
I'd hole up in our study, pretending to be engrossed in work when in reality I was deep into texting Jason. The kids started to voice their complaints, wanting more time with me. I'd brush it off, explaining that mommy had to work. This continued for weeks and my co-workers began noticing the change. Jason and I were suddenly closer and I wasn't giving him the cold shoulder anymore. I even went to the extent of leaving my car at home sometimes so Jason could give me a ride back to his apartment. Looking back, I realize how dumb that was. Anyone could have seen me sitting in Jason's car LOL and someone did see me LOL. But at the time I thought it was some romantic move. The whole situation seriously had me wrapped up in a cloud of oblivious choices and misguided notions of romance. There were numerous signs, almost like the universe itself was trying to send me warnings to put the brakes on this whole affair. Looking back, it's clear that these cautionary signals were scattered throughout my journey. Yet I foolishly chose to turn a blind eye to them. The first hints appeared in the form of my own guilt, a nagging feeling that should have acted as a red flag. Then... There were the moments of hesitation, those brief pauses before responding to Jason's messages when I could have reconsidered my actions. Even my kids' complaints and my husband's concerns served as glaring indicators that something was amiss. As if that wasn't enough, my co-workers started noticing the change in dynamics between Jason and me and the risky behavior of leaving my car behind just to share a ride with him was a glaring signal. It's almost comical how the universe threw these warning signs my way. And yet, in the whirlwind of emotions, I remained oblivious to the impending storm. It's a realization that hindsight often brings. The universe had been dropping hints, trying to redirect my course in my stubbornness, or perhaps sheer ignorance. I chose to ignore these signals just because I loved the thrill of my affair with Jason. At one time, my husband's actually caught me riding shotgun in Jason's car in the middle of traffic. It's a miracle she never spilled the beans to my husband, or maybe she just forgot, as she tends to do sometimes. Another possibility is that she thought she must have been mistaken since I managed to pull off a quick, inconspicuous duck when I spotted her. That moment could have blown the lid off the whole affair, but somehow luck was on my side and the secret stayed safe. Everything seemed like a typical workday until it all hit the fan. Jason and I were our usual flirty selves at work, sneaking off to the restroom for a quick, intimate session. During lunch, he brought me food and we chatted like any other day. We planned to head to his place after work, so I messaged my husband, telling him I'd be working overtime for a few extra hours. He was cool with it already, home and ready to watch the kids. Perfect, right? Work wrapped up, and as I headed to the parking lot, Jason was waiting for me. A few co-workers stopped to chat and one even asked if everything was okay between Jason and me. I spun this tale about how we'd become better friends. After I realized it was wrong to give him the cold shoulder, she seemed skeptical but didn't press further, just nodding and letting the conversation wrap up. Now it's important to note I knew Jason wasn't exactly Mr. Clean in the lifestyle department. He had a thing for drugs, but he was a functional addict. If you weren't super tight with him, you wouldn't guess it. Dude looked good, stayed fit, and had this glowing vibe that didn't scream drug addict. But here's the real kicker. Jason wasn't just into using. He also dabbled in dealing, and he kept a stash at his place. One time he tried to get me on the weed train, but it wasn't my thing. Swore off it real quick and never gave it another shot, lol. I finished chatting with the co-worker and made my way to meet Jason in the parking lot. Feeling a bit hungry... We decided to swing by McDonald's for some takeout after grabbing burgers and fries. We headed to Jason's apartment. Once there, we dug into our food, catching a movie as part of our usual routine. Then we started getting intimate. Things took a wild turn when mid-intimacy. We were interrupted by a bang on the door. Turns out it was the police. Panic set in and I started scrambling to get dressed. But Jason urged me to calm down, assuring me they probably didn't even have a permit to search him. Maybe they just had a few questions, he said. We reluctantly opened the door only to find ourselves immediately arrested. Shocked was an understatement. They flashed a warrant and proceeded to ransack Jason's apartment, uncovering not just weed but also some serious hard stuff. Both of us ended up in cuffs. But here's the kicker. As they were dragging me away, they dropped the bomb. That it wasn't just about the drugs. No. 
They believed I was in cahoots with Jason tagging me as a dealer too, and if that wasn't enough, they threw in adultery and infidelity. The shock hit me like a freight train. Infidelity. My mind raced. Did my husband report me? Did he somehow know about the affair? Living in South Carolina, where the laws against infidelity are no joke, added an extra layer of dread. Fines or even days in jail were on the table. And the last thing I wanted was to end up behind bars. In a desperate attempt, I tried explaining to the police officer and lying that I was clueless about Jason's illegal activities. However, my pleas fell on deaf ears as the officer insisted on waiting until we reached the police station to hear me out. So I begrudgingly stayed quiet during the journey. Once at the police station, they separated Jason and me, leading us into separate rooms for intense questioning. Overwhelmed with emotions, I broke down in tears and spilled the truth to the police officer. I admitted that I was married and had been cheating on my husband with Jason. I made it clear that Jason was fully aware of my marital status. However, when it came to the drug aspect, I decided to lie. I told the officer that I had no idea Jason was involved in drugs, that I never took any substances from him, and that he never disclosed his drug-dealing activities to me. My tears flowed freely as I confessed. I insisted on having my lawyer present, recognizing they couldn't detain me without pressing charges. The police informed me that I was free to go. However, they strongly recommended I get legal representation, emphasizing that their investigation would persist. They also said I would be called to testify against Jason in court. Of course, to save myself. I quickly agreed that as I was about to leave, one of the cops called me over and dropped a bomb. My husband had snitched on me, giving them Jason's address. They said they usually wouldn't spill the beans, but my husband insisted that they tell me to rub salt in the wound. They hit me with the news that I was now no longer welcome at home because of my cheating ways. I couldn't hold back the tears and I literally started crying again. The cops weren't exactly sympathetic to my tears, their expressions showing clear disdain for my infidelity. Despite their judgment, I resolved to go back and beg my husband for forgiveness, so I hopped into a taxi and headed home. But let's be real. What did I really expect? When I arrived, I found all my bags neatly stacked on the front porch, a cold and unwelcome reception, to say the least. Devastated. I knocked on the door, but there was no response. To say I was distraught would be an understatement. I stood there for hours crying, but it became evident that either they were purposely ignoring me or they weren't home. Left with no other option, I had to gather my bags and find refuge in a hotel for the night. I couldn't even go back to Jason's apartment because he had already blocked me. They had released him, but it was clear he was under investigation and might end up in jail. I am currently in the hotel room and I feel utterly lost. The weight of the situation has me in complete distress, and I've been crying for hours without a clear idea of what to do next. Attempting to reach out to Ethan, my husband has been met with silence. He won't pick up my calls or respond to my texts, even reaching out to my in-laws. Ethan's parents has proven fruitless as they refuse to answer the phone. My family lives in another state, and the distance makes it challenging to seek solace with them immediately. I am hesitant to travel tomorrow because my priority is to repair my marriage with Ethan and also work. I can't just up and leave. What do you think I should do? Read it. Please help. Update. Wow. Okay. It's been a month since I made that post and I never expected the post to blow up like this. I've gotten numerous DMS asking for an update, so I guess I owe you guys one. So here's everything that has gone down since. First of all, living in a hotel for a month, no matter how budget-friendly, turned out to be a financial burden. I've had to switch hotels twice in search of more affordable options. On top of this, the heartbreaking reality has set in. Ethan and I are heading for a divorce after a few weeks of enduring his silence. I reached a breaking point and sent Ethan a heartfelt text pleading for him to act like an adult and talk to me. Thankfully, he finally relented, breaking the ice and replying to me. We arranged a meeting in a neutral place, a restaurant. It was disheartening to see that he didn't bring the kids, but I understood his need for caution and lack of trust. The entire conversation was gut-wrenching when he asked me why I had done it. I couldn't come up with a single excuse. The weight of his disappointment was so sad. He told me I had shattered his heart that Ethan revealed that he was the one who called the cops on Jason. I admitted that I knew, as the police had informed me at the station. 
Ethan explained that he had instructed the cops to tell me because he had initially planned on cutting all ties with me. I couldn't help but wonder how he knew about Jason's drug involvement, but Ethan simply claimed he had sources. When I asked him about discovering my infidelity, he shared that he found out in various ways. He had seen my text messages with Jason and even had screenshots. Additionally, he claimed to have heard it from people in town, including some of my co-workers who had approached him. I was crushed. I couldn't stop the tears. All I could say on repeat was, I'm so sorry. I love you. I never meant for this to happen. But he wasn't buying it anymore. The trust was gone. Ethan said he wanted a divorce for our mental well-being. I broke down even because he made it clear he couldn't get past what I did. The lies I fed him only made things worse. He laid it all out, talking about how he handled everything at home babysitting, taking care of the kids while I lied about working late, actually spending time with Jason. The mess I created had wrecked my marriage. Ethan laid it into me. He had been the one carrying way more weight, earning more than me, taking on all the responsibilities, and he didn't even mind that. He reminded me of how absent I was from the kids absorbed in my own world with Jason. Ethan confessed that he had known about it for a while, hoping I would change, but I never did. He admitted that he believed I wouldn't have stopped if he hadn't made the call to the police. It was like a reality check and a wake-up call. Ethan slammed the door on forgiveness and told me it was never happening. He told me divorce papers were coming. He wanted custody of the kids since he had proof me being absent a lot in their lives. He asked where I was currently staying, and when I told him a hotel, he teased me about crashing in a hotel and questioned why I wasn't bunking with Jason, making me cry even more now. He then told me he was taking the money in our joint account. I couldn't complain. It was majorly his money, but he promised. Leave me a little to get by for a few weeks. Ethan said he'd shoot me a text when the divorce papers were ready. When I asked about the kids, he assured me we could meet up next weekend, despite the fact that I had hurt him. He promised not to keep me from seeing them, but he made it clear that fixing things with the kids was on me as they'd grown distant during my absence. It hurt, but I couldn't deny that Ethan was speaking the truth and the weight of my own actions hit me hard. After our heart-wrenching conversation, Ethan left. He even footed the bill for our drinks at the restaurant and left the waitress a tip. I'm still waiting for those divorce papers when they come. I won't put up a fight. I know I deserve every bit of it and I'll sign them without a single complaint. It's the least I can do after everything that went down. As for Jason, let's just say he's become a ghost in my life. I haven't seen or talked to him in a while. And truth be told, I don't even care about his fate anymore. I'm still expecting a call from the cops. And when the time comes, I'll testify against him without a second thought. That's the whole scoop on what's been going down recently. Appreciate you taking the time to listen. Here's a nugget of wisdom for everyone out there. Steer clear of cheating on your partner. Seriously, it's not worth it. Take a lesson from my missteps. Back to square one for me because, well, I made some dumb choices. Thank you for spending the time to hear today's story. If you enjoyed this story, please like it and subscribe if you haven't done so already. If you have a story to share about your or another person's situation, please do not hesitate to contact me. Take care.